Can everyone please take their seats? We're about to begin the program for our day. My name is Caitlin Johnston, and this is my co MC, Sam Harushka. We are about to begin. Oh, we will be being the MCs for this morning of the forum today. Manahu Ananiane, Caitlin Johnston, Numanu, Paihupue, Nu Kimariu. Hello, everyone. My name is Caitlin Johnston. I come from where the water flows in Bishop, California. I'm the female co president for Unity, and I will be one of the morning MCs today. Good morning, everybody. My name is Samuel Hrotsika. Uh, I have the honor of being born and raised in Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, shout out to all the other Alaska folks in, in town. It's been a long way from home for us. Um, I'm, <laughs> yep, shout out, Ben. Uh, I'm, I'm a Nungun, Yupik, Winamum, Wintu, and Dene. Uh, so when people ask me where I come from, similar to most of you, I have a hard time telling them. To break that down, though, my family on my Alaska Native side is from Ikuk, Alaska, and then uh, on the Winamum, Wintu side at a ben Big Bend Rancheria in California, and on my Dene side at a Fish Point on the Navajo Nation Reservation. I'm the proud son of Tommy and Vanessa Hrotsika and the older sibling of uh, my younger sibling, Nishoni Hrotsika. Uh, and I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with everybody this morning. And then we're just going to go over a few housekeeping items. So first and foremost, please use our hashtag, hashtag WHTYF for White House Tribal Youth Forum. And also, please check out your conference packets. You'll see all sorts of great information in there pursuant to today and other resources as well. And throughout the day, if you need to use the restroom, the restrooms will be on the exit, go through the Great Hall, and if you turn left, pass the elevators and you'll see the restroom sign on the right or left-hand side. And furthermore, a little bit of a change from what you might have in your conference packets and what you've seen before. If you'd like to use the internet, please select HHS Visitor and hit Accept to be connected to the Wi-Fi. And there are also timekeepers here in the front for those who will be participating on stage today. If you will be participating in a panel, please keep an eye out for those timekeepers who will indicate how many minutes you have left in your allotted slot of time. So a couple of last points here. One is that for any questions that might be out to the crowd, we've got a bunch of folks online and folks using translation services as well. To that end, if you're answering any question at your tables, please remember that you do have microphones. They are bendy, so don't feel like you've got to rush around the table or try and get a mic from somebody up on stage. Please feel free to sit down, relax, and answer the question at your table. For the translation services, which we will all need at one point later on today, um, you've got the headphones at your tables as well. Number one is for English. Number three is translation to Spanish. With that, we would like to turn it over to the descendants and Kiyosha Harvey from the San Carlos Apache tribe for an opening prayer song. Thank you. Hi, guys. Good morning. How are you guys feeling? You guys still awake out there? So can you guys all please stand and remove your hats or hoods and bow your heads for the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Thank you to the descendants in Keisha Harvey for the prayer and wonderful song. We'd like to start off by saying a huge thank you to the many sponsors who made this event possible. First, a big thank you to the Center of Native American Youth and to Unity for their partnership to make this happen. We'd also like to thank Walmart, Chance and Tyler Rush, National Center for, Ma for American Indian Enterprise Development, Van On fin De Foundation, Bank of America, San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, Bezos Family Foundation, the Christ Christians Fund, Comcast NBC Universal, M Margaret A. Cargill Philanthropies, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, and Casey Family Programs. Next, it's my honor to introduce Senior Advisor and Assistant to the President, Tom Perez. Mr. Perez serves as the Director of the White House Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, where he oversees the White House's engagement with tribal, state, and local governments. Mr. Perez brings decades of local, state, and federal experience to the White House, having served as a former Montgomery County, Maryland council member, the Secretary of Maryland's Department of Labor, Licensing, and Regulation, as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice, as Director of the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and as Secretary of Labor under President Obama. Everyone, please welcome Mr. Tom Perez. Can you hear me? Oh, hey, hey, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor. Sam, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Welcome to the Department of Health and Human Services. And I want you to take a look at the wall. There's, I, I used to work here back when I had hair about 20 some odd years ago. I worked for that woman over there, Donna Shalala, who's on the wall there. And uh, a recent addition to this wall, thanks to Secretary Becerra, are the tribal flags of the Secretary's Advisory Council on Tribal Affairs. And by the way, this isn't a temporary exhibit for today's Tribal Youth Summit. This is a permanent addition to the Department of Health and Human Services because you will always have a seat at the table in this administration. So it's a really exciting, exciting uh, addition. I also want to um, ask, we have some special international guests, and I would love for our guests, our special indigenous youth from Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Guatemala, Honduras, and Mexico. Could you please stand up so that we can acknowledge all of you? It's, it's such an honor to have all of you here today. Thank you so much for traveling here. Muchisimas gracias por su presencia aquí. What a great, great, great honor it is to have all of you here. Folks, um, I am thrilled to look here and look around this room. I'm about three standard deviations from the mean on age. And you know what? That's great because you all are going to be our bosses someday. I have no doubt about that. Our, our goal today is to listen. This entire day was designed by you. It is for you. It is of you. And you are here today because we want to hear your voices. You will always not only have a seat at the table, but a voice at the table. That's what it's about. Today is about listening. It's about learning. And it's about figuring out how we can work collaboratively with you to make sure you realize your highest and best dreams. You know, the most important dependent clause in the English language is in the Constitution of the United States. We, the people, in order to form a more perfect union. When our union was formed, we knew it was imperfect. And we knew that there were original sins in this country one of which was our mistreatment of tribal nations. We knew that. And the journey to form a more perfect union is a journey, imperfect and not always a straight line, but it is that journey that brings us here today 
to our tribal youth forum because President Obama talked about this in 2009 in our first forum and President Biden and Vice President Harris are talking about this now, making sure we have respect for our nation to nation relationships with tribes. That's what this is about. And this is about the future. You are the future. I want you to know that anything you want to do, you can do. Because you know what? My parents came here from the Dominican Republic. I never dreamed in a million years that I'd have an opportunity to work for the likes of Senator Kennedy and, and President Clinton and President Obama and now President Biden and Vice President Harris. Because you see, you know, I, I was 12 years old when my dad died. You know, my mom almost died that same summer. And uh, you know what we had that I know I hope you have as well? I had family and community, people helping me out. I had Pell Grants. That really helped me out. Worked any job I could. Learned the value of hard work. One summer I worked on the back of a trash truck. One summer I was a baseball umpire because I had a really deceptive fastball. I wanted to be a professional baseball player, but my fastball was deceptive. That is to say it was slower than you think. So I needed another career, but I wanted to change the world. And I thought that public service was a way to make sure we change the world. And I'm so excited about what we've been able to do together. Respecting our, our, our relationships, nation to nation with tribes. And I've had the privilege throughout my career in public service of working side by side on health care issues, on empowerment issues, making sure we never forget women. <laughs> making sure that when you apply for a grant, you don't have to go through a state, you apply independently as a sovereign nation. That's what we're talking about. Making sure you can realize your highest dreams. And that's what today is about. I hope that you will come away from here today empowered to continue your leadership role. You've been selected because you are leaders already in your communities. I want you to be our bosses here. I want you to follow the example of Congresswoman Peltola, who is now just doing remarkable things here in the United States Congress. We want you to follow the leadership of one of my great friends, Secretary Deb Holland, the first Native American cabinet secretary. That can be you, day in and day out. I want you to dream big. You know, I want you to live optimistically. Some days it's hard to be optimistic when you are facing so many challenges. But I choose to be optimistic. I choose to be optimistic because I think the future has incredible opportunities for us. And today we're going to hear from you about those challenges, those opportunities. And I hope you know that everybody here in the Biden-Harris administration is here to work together with you. This is not meant to be a one-off. You come here for a day and then we don't see you again. This is meant to be a continuation of dialogue. Rose, thank you so much. Rose Petoskey works with us here. She's got game. Michigander. We work together. Anything you need, don't hesitate to ask Rose. Anything you need, don't hesitate to ask me. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. This is your day. And this is a day for us to listen, learn, and make sure we redouble our efforts to build out those partnerships so that you not only have a seat at the table, you have a megaphone at the table. That's what it's about. We got a lot of work to do, folks, and we're going to do it together because we are a better nation when we are working together, when we build a big table, when everyone at that table has that voice. Thanks so much for having me. Have a wonderful day, and make sure your voices are clearly heard. And thank you to our international partners who are here with us today. Have a great day. Thank you, Tom. Next, um, before we get started with our next part, um, this is last call for breakfast. If you want anything, um, get it now. Um, 
Next, it is my honor to introduce video remarks from Secretary Deb Holland. Secretary Deb Holland is an enrolled member of the Pueblo of, S of Laguna in New Mexico. She made history when she became the first Native American to serve a cabinet secretary. Throughout her career in public service, Secretary Holland has broken barriers and opened doors of opportunity for future generations. Gwadzi haupa, duhiname itzakuitsa shui mihanu. Hello everyone, it's an honor to join you for the White House Tribal Youth Summit. I'm so glad you are here and I'm sorry that I'm not able to join you in person. I hope this summit gives you the chance to share your stories, ideas, and visions for the future. These connections make our collective efforts stronger and more resilient to the challenges we face. Each indigenous young person here is a dream that our ancestors had when they faced hardship and survived against seemingly insurmountable odds. When I think of all of you gathered together, I can't help but be thankful. You were light years ahead of where I was when I was in high school and even in my early 20s. In 1978, on the day I graduated from high school, I had no college applications in the queue and not a thought about a career. I went from part-time to full-time at the local bakery where I had worked since I was 15. I had early and very long hours until one day I looked in the mirror and asked myself if I would be doing that for the rest of my life. And so I started my first semester at the University of New Mexico when I was 28 years old. And by the time I started law school, I was a single mom. I never imagined that a day like today would be in my future. I never even thought about serving as one of the first Native women in Congress until I did. I also never thought that the things I learned from my grandfather in the cornfield would inform a career in conservation. Our connection to the earth is ingrained in us as children, and today I am telling you that these careers exist for you and for us. Luckily, you have many opportunities before you now. When I was growing up on the Pueblo of Laguna in New Mexico, I learned how every living thing on earth is connected and how important indigenous stewardship is to our planet. I want everyone to have the formative experiences that continue to shape the work I do today. That's why I launched the Indian Youth Service Corps. Through this program, we provide meaningful education, employment, and training opportunities to indigenous youth through conservation projects on public and tribal lands. The Corps will help young people just like you strengthen your connection to the lands and waters that our ancestors have cared for since time immemorial. I hope each of you consider seeking out opportunities through this program to inspire careers that keep our lands and waters thriving for future generations. This is President Biden's and my goal to make sure our federal workforce includes the lived experiences and perspectives that all of you bring to the table, because we know that representation matters. At Interior, we're centering the voices of indigenous people in all that we do, from our work to strengthen tribal sovereignty and governance, to protect and preserve our ways of life, from our native languages to our sacred cultural practices and to uplift and empower indigenous students to be leaders in future administrations. We have a lot of work to do. Every time I consider the impacts of the decisions we make at the Department of the Interior, I think about the generations to come who will have to live with those decisions. It's young leaders like you who give me hope for the future. You are not just the leaders of tomorrow, you're the leaders of today. I may have broken some barriers, but I want you to know that I'm leaving the ladder down behind me for all of you to climb, and I look forward to carrying you on my shoulders so you can accomplish your goals. Dawa'e, thank you.
Now I am very excited to introduce Tabu for some opening remarks and words of encouragement to begin our day. Jimmy Gomez, also known as Tabu, is not, only, is not just a member of the global chart-topping sensation, the Black Eyed Peas, but is also an accomplished dancer, actor, author, and philanthropist. Born in East LA, Tabu followed his dream of being an entertainer and rose from humble beginnings to unimaginable success. The fates aligned in 1992 when Tabu met his fellow bandmates Will I Am and Apple the App at a hip hop club in LA. In 1995, while working at Disneyland during the day, at night Tabu would perform with this group, the Black Eyed Peas. In 2003, the group released their breakout album, Elefunk, launching the Black Eyed Peas into superstardom. Monkey Business, their fourth album, followed with more hits like Don't Funk With My Heart and My Humps. Their fifth album, The End, has broken several Billboard records, with singles like Boom Boom Pow and I Got a Feelin' staying at number one for over 27 weeks. Following on their success, in November 2010, they released their sixth album, The Beginning. In February 2011, the group had the honor of performing at the Super Bowl 45 halftime show, solidifying them as one of the biggest acts in music history. With that performance, Taboo has the distinction of being the first indigenous Mexican American to headline the Super Bowl halftime show. <laughs> Having sold a staggering 65 million albums worldwide, the Grammy Award winners have brought their enigmatic fusion of pop, hip hop, and dance music to a huge global audience. Taboo is now a driving force behind BEP's return after battling cancer and subsequently beating it in 2014. Two years later, yes, please give it up for that. Two years later, Taboo was a strong and inspiring voice to his fellow water protectors at Standing Rock in 2016. He also served as a member of the board of directors for the Biden Cancer Initiative. He has now embraced the role as a writer at Marvel Comics and just released a book he co-wrote with his writing partner, B. Earl, called Werewolf by Night. It was also part of the first indigenous voices at Marvel, along with other indigenous storytellers. Along with comics, he has released a children's book about identity and is focused on programming for kids through an indigenous lens. In everything he's done, Taboo has worked to provide an inclusive environment for everyone to take inspiration from, to be proud of who they are, and especially where they come from. Everyone. Please give a warm welcome to Taboo. One, two, one, two. Let me get a picture real quick. Let me get a real quick picture. Let me pretend. I'm pretending I'm someone important, ladies and gentlemen. What's up, everybody? I said, what's up, everybody? I like that. I like that. So uh, what's up, y'all? My name is Jimmy Gomez, a.k.a. Tabu Nawasha. I'm a proud Shoshone, Hopi, and Mexicano. Sonora representing. My sister right here was representing Sonora right there. Boom. Um, but most important, I'm just proud to be a husband and a father. And I'm very proud to be rocking with you guys today. Wait, am I doing a show? Just kidding. I'm here to speak from the heart and just share a couple of words of motivation and inspiration and let you guys know how important it is to be here celebrating this amazing event. This is a celebration. And I like to say this is indigenous excellence. Let me repeat, ladies and gentlemen, indigenous excellence. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I like that. And when I say indigenous excellence, it speaks to the whole world. So I want to acknowledge mis parientes de Colombia, mi pariente de México. Uh, muito obrigado, my, my relative pariente de Brazil. Um, it's important for us to acknowledge our indigenous relatives from around the world, because it's not just US and it's not just Canada, it's the whole world. We represent a demographic of inspiration, motivation, and something that we leave to inspire the youth. And that's why I'm here. 
I came from Los Angeles to do a concert last night. Were you guys at the show last night? That was dope. That was really fun. I had a great time just rocking out, um, being there with you guys, feeling inspired, feeling motivated. Um, but the most important thing is accountability. And when I heard Mr. Perez say, we're going to have a seat at the table, we're going to do all this, well, I'm here to make sure that we do that. Go ahead. Because you best believe with this huge megaphone, I'm going to hold them accountable. I am. I got his info. I got his assistant. We're, we're, I'm dialed in, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm not here to talk mess and kind of blow smoke up your ass. I'm here to be of service and to really inspire and to motivate you guys and know that there's no other motive than to just lead by example and be an amazing relative to inspire our youth and continue doing the work to be of service and give our seven generations a better tomorrow. All right, I wrote this poem last night when, uh, after I got off the, sh the, the stage, I said to myself, am I gonna be that guy that speaks from the heart and has this big speech? Or am I be gonna be the guy that speaks from the heart and has some words of encouragement that really means something? And so I wrote this, and if you guys don't mind, it's short, but it's from the heart, and I want you guys to know how important this was, that I actually, I threw these, these lines away many times until I came to a, a great um, connection to be able to tell my story, um, but also to inspire the youth. So, when I speak about indigenous excellence, I'm speaking to everyone in this room. It's beautiful to see our matriarchs leading the beautiful round dance to the rhythm and of the hand drum connected through frequencies of life that's a mosaic of expression. Indigenous excellence is not just a term. It's not just a way of being. It's confident, but not arrogant. It's strength, not weakness. It's to uplift the people, not to bring us down. It's to love, not to hate. It's to, su to be supportive, not to be envious. It's respect for our past while honoring our traditions. It's scholars, it's professors, it's CEOs and entrepreneurs. It's futurism, it's tech. It's respecting Mother Earth and its elements. It's res ball. Hell yeah. It's skateboarding. It's beadwork. It's turquoise. It's clothing design. It's sneaker heads, especially if you're rocking the Nike N7s, right, Sam? It's organizers and lawyers, doctors and healers. It's people that bring that good medicine. It's relatives on the front lines and some relatives that stand up just like Deb Holland of Capitol Hill. It's activism, it's DJing like my man Travel Touch right here. Make some noise for Travel Touch. <laughs> it's producing and rapping. It's now, it's powwow style. It's break dancing. It's playing sports like my sister right there, Silent Rain, dope softball player. Make some noise for Silent Rain. It's writing for Marvel Comics. I always say I, I started picking up trash at Disney in 1994, and guess what? This indigenous man is now writing for Marvel Comics in 2023. And I say that humbly, ladies and gentlemen, for all my allies that are sitting there probably looking at me like, I thought you said it was about humility. See how I said it? Humility. Humility. It's show running, it's directing, it's total inspiration for our seven generations. So I ask everyone, do you stand with me when I say indigenous excellence? Because I stand up with my fist up for indigenous excellence, and I do this from here to beyond. There you go, right there, one dude, one guy. Next man, put your fist up. Put your fist up for love, for respect, for empathy, and most of all, for indigenous excellence. Let's go. Ladies and gentlemen, I need you to stand up. I need everybody to stand up. 
Cause we gonna feel a little like, like we could move a little bit and not just be rigid, not just be in our seats. We did this last night, we gonna do it again. Turn it up a little bit. Here's a remix of Come and Get Your Love. So feel free to move around. Yeah, it's okay to move, it's cool. Even my white allies can move. Yep. If you're feeling good, make some noise. I can't hear you. If you're feeling good, make some noise. When this hook comes, I want everybody to see this hook with me. Are you ready? One, two, three, let's go. I can't hear you. Louder. One more time. My name is Tabu. I love you guys. Y'all never thought I'd be jamming out with a member of the Black Eyed Peas, for real. Let's give it up one more time for Taboo. That made my morning. Thank you so much for those inspiring words to get us started. We are now going to transition over into our morning icebreaker activity. Jackson. It's nice to see all of you here today. My name is Seneca Jackson. I'm 20 years old. I attend the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, yeah. Hello everybody. My name is Marla Messerina. I come from Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, Minnesota, and I'm the National Midwest Regional Representative for Unity. All right, so for our icebreaker today, we're just going to ask all of you to get out of your seats, get moving, meet somebody new, um, just partner up with them. Yeah. And once you have found somebody, introduce yourself and ask each other the question, what is one thing, what is your, one of your favorite things about being indigenous? So if you all want to go ahead and just take a seat for now, I know that it's still a little early. You guys are all still trying to wake up. So, Marla, what are you looking forward to in today's agenda? I'm looking forward to our discussions and speaking with everyone here. What are you looking forward to? Um, I'm looking forward to hearing from all of the youth here. Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing these panels and being able to ask these questions of all the panelists. And I just look forward to hearing what we all have to say. Um, and so, we'll, well, thank you guys for all participating in our icebreakers, and yeah. Big wave, big wave, man. Thank you guys for participating in the icebreaker. Um, we are going to take a quick 15 minute break, but before you guys leave or get up, don't forget to always wear your name tag and your little wristband, just so you're, they know that you are from this event. Make sure you're taking pictures with all your new friends. There's tons of signage to take lots of pictures. Make those memories with your new friends. And after your 15 minute break, we will get started again. Thank you. So as everybody settles back in, I, I just wanted to kind of introduce myself in a different way. You know, For the majority of my time while I'm out here in Washington, DC, I have the extreme honor of working in the office of US Representative Mary Sattler Peltola. I handle all of her indigenous and rural affairs. So I'm the person behind the scenes that was talked about earlier by Mr. Perez. I'm one of those folks who tries to make things happen, similar to what Taboo was saying. And so I just wanted to try and open it up with a small group discussion amongst your individual tables. If you as an activist and as an advocate, as a person who is living with a lot of, as we all are, these climate issues within our backyards, if, you're, if you have the opportunity to meet with somebody like me in that other hat, where we're in the back rooms talking about what we can actually do on a policy level, 
locally, statewide, nationally at the federal level, what would you like somebody like me to know and carry with me? What work are you doing within your individual communities to make sure that that happens? And if we had a takeaway, if we only had five minutes to talk, if we're meeting in passing, what do you want me to walk away with? What does that look like in terms of a timeline, in terms of specific deliverables? How might you be able to hold me accountable? And how might I be able to better serve you as an official? So I'll, we'll just leave you with that for around 10 minutes, then we'll come back together just as a staging ground for the conversation that we'll have in just a little bit. Thank you, guys. It is my pleasure to introduce the youth participating in the first panel focus on climate resilience. Bronson Azama. And then now we'd like to also introduce our fellow panelists as well, um, beginning with um, Ali Zaidi, um, who serves as um, assistant to the president and national climate advisor. In this role, he leads the White House Climate Policy Office, which coordinates policy development and President Biden's all of government approach to tackle the climate crisis, create good paying union jobs and advance environmental justice. Zaidi is a longtime advisor to President Biden, having provided counsel and leadership in policy development, legislation, and executive action from day one of the administration and on the, and on the Biden presidential transition and campaign. Before his current role, he served as Deputy National Climate Advisor. Mahalo for being here. Thank you. And then Thank next, you. we also have Chair Brenda Mallory. Brenda Mallory is the 12th Chair of the White House Council on Environmental quality and first African-American to serve in this position. As chair, uh, as chair, she advises the president on environmental and natural resources, policies that improve, pr preserve, and protect public health and the environment for America's communities. She is focused particularly on addressing the environmental justice and climate change challenges the nation faces. While advancing opportunities for job growth and economic development, Chair Mallory has decades of experience in both the private and public sector, including spending nearly 20 years at the Environmental Protection Agency and CEQ, serving in a number of senior roles in Chair Mallory's first stint at CEQ as the general counsel. She helped shape many of President Obama's signature envir uh, environmental, and we love the scripts too, <laughs> environmental and natural resource policy successes. Now as chair, she is advancing President Biden's ambitious climate and environmental justice agenda. Chair Mallory was the first in her family to attend college, graduating from Yale with a double major in history and sociology, and then from Columbia Law School as a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar. Yeah, mahalo. And now I'd like to really hand it over to Anagali for this next part. Hello, everybody. Uh, so this first question will be directed to Chair Mallory. Chair Mallory, can you share with us some of the work the Council on Environmental Quality has been doing with tribes regarding climate resilience? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Hello, everyone. It is such a pleasure to be here. And then I have to say, it's been great just uh, sitting out back, listening to the vibe in the room. Um, having just come off of the New York Marathon, where my son ran his first race, I'm like seriously into the youth vibe this morning. So I'm just really grateful to be here this morning. Um, so CEQ has been involved in a number of the president's initiatives uh, relating to tribes and the integration of tribes into the work that the administration is doing. And I think the key anchor for all of the, the work that the administration is undertaking is recognizing the importance of incorporating, bringing to the table, making sure that, that tribes are have a, a serious role in our policy development, in the, um, the funding and other uh, benefits that we're able to um, that we're able to give out at this, in this administration because of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law to signature accomplishments of the president. And we are really um, recognizing both the tribal sovereignty, tribal trust, and tribal treaty rights as things that are very important. So a um, couple of quick examples. We just recently released a national resilience framework um, for, uh, for, the, for the government to describe how we are going to go about tackling some of the challenges with resilience across the country. And that's been something that where 
tribal uh, interests, tribal rights have been really central to that in making sure that we both are recognizing indigenous knowledge, understanding the importance of some of the uh, impacts on the ground that are, uh, are affecting folks and how we can take steps to, to improve them um, on the impacts and the, the issues that folks are having to deal with. Um, so that's one, uh, one example. We've also um, been working on just creating across the government a um, recognition of indig indigenous knowledge in all the work that the federal government does, like just making it, uh, creating a framework in which federal agencies, as a matter of course, are looking to integrate indigenous knowledge in places where folks want it uh, included, because right? we recognize who owns the indigenous knowledge and we want to make sure that that is reflected in, in the work. And then two, uh, the last two things I'll mention, just in terms of um, thinking about how we are, are protecting and taking more resilient activities, like the, the president has been very focused on ensuring that as we are protecting uh, places in this country that they are um, representative of all of the interests of uh, of folks and tribal interests in particular have been front and center. And so a couple of recent um, national monuments that were, um, that were designated and that also play a really important part as we think about resilience and uh, ecosystem protection uh, are uh, Avikwame in Nevada and Baj Nawajo Itkak Kukvini in um, Arizona. And so um, I'll stop there because I'm not sure exactly how many other issues that we want to raise at this point, but such a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Our next question is for Mr. Zaidi. And it's, can you share with us an overview of the Biden-Harris administration's climate strategy and how the administration is engaging tribal communities to combat climate change? That's a great question, and um, just delighted to be here. Uh, our approach to climate change, I think, is very unique in that um, we're really trying to tackle uh, the pollution that drives climate change in every sector of the economy. Um, so folks, oftentimes, when they think about climate change, they think about solar and wind in the power sector, they think about electric vehicles, hydrogen-based vehicles in the transportation sector, but then their sort of imagination stops. The reality is we've got climate challenges and climate opportunities in buildings, in heavy industry, in the agriculture and land sector. And I think what's really unique about the president's approach is making sure we're reaching out and trying to grab the opportunity in each of these sectors and to do it in a way that brings everybody in to the solutions. And that doesn't just mean handing people solar panels. It means literally building them into the front end of how we plan and deploy. And that's on the greenhouse gas side. Um, another big piece of it is making sure we're doing the work of adaptation and resilience. And again, we've got to focus on every sector of the economy. I'll give you an example of what I mean by pulling people into the front end of the process. So a few of us, um, uh, Secretary Holland, myself, uh, some of the team flew to the Four Corners area and had a roundtable discussion in Farmington, New Mexico. And as we're sitting around there talking about clean energy transition, we're talking about the massive solar opportunity and wind opportunity uh, in New Mexico, in Arizona, and Colorado, um, there were some folks from the Navajo Nation that were there. And they talked about how it was important at this moment, not just to make sure we deployed those panels, but that they were, that this clean energy economy was stood up in a way that the prosperity was equally shared <laughs> and the terms of engagement were a level playing field. Um, I, I often like to say that climate change is a conversation about power. And I don't just mean electricity, I mean who has the power in shaping these solutions. And that's what the Navajo Nation leaders were talking about. So when we talked about solar, they talked about owning the interconnection and the grid that was going to move that power. So it didn't just cross over their land that it enriched the people 
of the Navajo Nation. That's a key part of how we're approaching climate change. I'll give you another example. Um, I went out to Alaska where um, we've spent a lot of time trying to preserve the Tongass National Forest. Now, this, this is a conversation happening all around the world. How do we get out in front of deforestation and actually be proponents of saving these profound national and international treasures? They belong to all of us and they belong to the next generation. And so many people have had this conversation over the last several decades, right? How do we keep these trees in the ground, continuing to breathe in the pollution that we put up in the sky and sequester it into the ground? And as we're talking to the indigenous leaders from the region, they said, look, this is actually a huge opportunity moment for us, this increased consciousness of climate change, because they're able now to tap into the carbon market that's created in California and actually get paid to preserve forest land in the Tongass National Forest. That's the kind of solutions we need to create, right? So that you are trustees of a landscape. The only way to get revenue out of that landscape shouldn't be to harvest the timber. You should get paid for the work that you're doing conserving the natural resource. And for the first time ever, we're not just doing that in forests, we're doing that in agriculture as well. Lots of tribes, partners of ours, as we've signed up over 25 million acres across the United States to do climate smart agriculture practices. And by the way, that idea, the idea to use our know-how of how to grow and raise agriculture and, and livestock in a way that's climate positive, that's informed by indigenous knowledge, right? So, you know, it's really easy when we talk about our climate policy to say, well, you know, we got this tax credit and tribes can use them and we've got this manufacturing boom that's happening in the United States and that benefits everybody. It's, it's easy to talk about it in the macro. I think what's so powerful about the Biden approach to taking on climate is that we've got people involved at the front end, inspired and learning from indigenous knowledge, young people like you shaping how we go out and do this work, the prosperity and value being returned to tribal communities so often left out and left behind. So we're not just gonna make a big step forward on climate. We're not just gonna reduce our emissions. We're not all just doing an accounting exercise. We're gonna seize this moment to fundamentally transform on questions of justice and fairness and prosperity and bring hope to our community. So that's the climate approach in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate your words and just the transparency. I think that the United States and the administration has so much to learn from our tribes, but especially our youth, because when rising sea level happens, when typhoon hits our communities, those that really help our communities are our own. So I really appreciate the tribal to tribal consultation that's happening between um, the administration. Um, but our next question uh, will be for our youth here on the stage, um, who are really phenomenal. Um, I wanted to ask, what are the wins in the climate resiliency space that are bringing you hope? And I'll start with Avery. Um, so uh, I study wildlife, wildlife biologists. So I kind of see climate change um, through the lens of wildlife and traditional wildlife management. Um, so for me, um, I remember my first time seeing a bison back home in Oklahoma, um, and it was a really big turning moment for me. And for my grandfather explained to me how that bison was really synonymous with who we were as a people. Um, you know, just how we had to endure forced relocation and all these, you know, struggles and, and you know, Everyone in this room knows that and can feel that. The bisons had to do similar things. You know, they went through a similar genocide of, of them in an attempt to get to us. And so those bison today stand as kind of that last remaining connection or thread we have. Um, and that's the case with wildlife all across North America for different indigenous peoples. Um, and they can be really heavily impacted by climate change. Um, bison in particular, we're seeing lots of stuff with salmon. Um, in the Great Lakes region, moose are becoming infected with a brain parasite called P. tenuous. 
um, and wolves too. And so what really inspires me and what brings me hope, Charity, um, is all the really amazing indigenous folks who are out there working to save these wild animals um, as that kind of last you know, connection we have um, to the land and to our people. Um, and so again, kind of a different take on climate change and not maybe what first comes to mind, um, but I think you know, reading these things about the Yurok tribe saving California condors. Um, yeah, <laughs> and folks in the Pacific Northwest doing things with salmon. Um, and I work with wolves in Michigan, and that's just so beautiful to see how we're able to um, keep these animals alive as kind of that life force um, and connection we have to our ancestors. Mahalo nui, Avery. Um, so, aloha mai kako, kainoa again, um, hail from Hawaii. Um, and, and just like kind of reframing a little bit of like part of the conversation, um, at least for me, like in the, the positives are in the opportunities to make positive change. Um, and, and to the points of that too, I think it's important for us to really think about how we frame these discussions and how we frame the direction in which we're going. It's not so much that we're going into something new, but actually when we're talking about issues like food, energy, water, it's actually us looking back into the past again. We're going back to something. Where are we measuring from, right? What are the metrics of success in which we're framing the direction in which we navigate this canoe um, in that sense? Because when, when, when I think about us measuring, it's, it's easy to say what we're doing is good when we're measuring from what's bad, right? It's like, yeah, that's, we were in a bad space and now we're doing, a, we're doing quite some good. So now we're doing really good. But when we're really looking at where we were as a people, as in relationship to this place and to each other, then I think we're still behind in a lot of these instances. But even though that may seem like it's negative, it's still an opportunity for us to really guide the conversations, to guide the solutions. Um, especially when we're talking about, and I'm always concerned because I'm um, being from um, the Pacific, and like it was shared earlier, there are this idea that everything's interconnected. You know, we look at the whole to inform the parts versus the parts to inform the whole. So when we're talking about transitioning and going into a high-tech future, for us, we understand there's a high-tech cost. You know, a lot of our traditional landscapes sit on a lot of the rare earth minerals in which need, is needed for the transition. So for us in the Pacific, we're privileged to have conversations, Chamber of Commerce, Pacific, um, Pacific Business Training Center, to gather elders to inform what are the innovation perspectives from our kupuna, from our elders to inform the direction we need to go holistically, as well as a part of different opportunities of bringing our people together, Rising Voices, Center for Earth, uh, Indigenous and Earth um, Sciences, uh, where we can have these holistic conversations together. It's not about us working in our individual silos, but rather coming together to really start having hard conversations to identify what is the directions we can go. Because as they say in the Pacific, he va'a he moku, he moku he va'a. an island is a canoe and a canoe is an island. So may we all learn how to navigate this island called Earth together. Um, so mahalo. Thank you. That was really good. <laughs> Um, when I think of uh, climate resilience, like wins for Indian country, I look around at you guys and I see how we all take on that like uh, responsibility that our communities um, have been taking on for generations. We are a part of this fight for climate resilience. I think of the um, statistic that says that even though we make up the smallest ethnic group, we still manage to save 80% of the world's biodiversity. And I think um, looking at um, successful land back movements like the Segorite Land Trust, the Waterfall Unity Alliance, and all of these other movements, I think how like we are on the verge of a place where land back is the reality, where our communities have, um, have that, um, yeah, that <laughs> land back. <laughs> um, and like, yeah, we just inherit so much generational strength and how we're using it in these spaces just gives me enough hope to keep going. Thank you. I really appreciate all your guys' responses. And again, going back to what Nakli was saying, it's all the youth here that give me hope when we think about climate resilience. And when I think about some of the wins that are happening, I think about what's happening on the international stage with our people all over the world. Some of my closest friends live in Greenland, live in Nunavut. Um, and it's important that we as Native youth understand that we are not alone in what we experience. Um, and as we're preparing 
for COP. That's literally happening happening in less than a month now. I'm thinking about the loss and damages fund that was developed and led by youth, but specifically was led by Pacifica youth, because what we're seeing in the Pacific um, is that our islands are disappearing. Tuvalu, um, American territories like American Samoa, Guam, which have been heavily affected by the military, um, youth from those places went to COP and I, I am incredibly thankful that the administration is um, directly helping and uh, compensating folks that are combating climate change and are helping um, to do that in Tonga's National Rainforest. It's like one of the largest carbon sinks. And it's, I, I'm incredibly happy that our Native people, some of my friends there, are getting compensated for continuing to preserve and protect that. But one of my biggest concerns is how are we holding some of the biggest uh, polluters accountable um, in this country, and this is a huge topic. Uh, early, earlier this year, just in New York City, over 75,000 people gathered in the streets of New York to come together just for one thing, and that was to completely stop the fossil fuel industry and to think about what a complete uh, phase from the fossil fuel industry could look like in our world. Um, because it, it doesn't only affect um, our Native people here uh, in the United States and Alaska, but affects my family in Samoa, it affects Inuit people in Canada, it affects people in Nunavut, it affects people in the Amazon, it affects all of us all over the world. Um, and what we've seen is that extractive industries really don't help our people. And it's scary to say, but um, you see that time and time again, it's our youth that are saying something. Because what more do we have to lose um, when we're losing land and when we're losing an environment that doesn't look the same as it did for our grandfathers, as it did for our grandmothers? Um, so it's our youth on the international stage, not just the youth here, but our youth all over the world, indigenous youth, our black youth, who are really leading this movement to think about how are we holding the biggest uh, polluters accountable, but also how are we ensuring that those who are protecting our climate, which our native people, um, are getting compensated that, compensating for that because they deserve their flowers too. Um, so I really appreciate your guys' words and remarks, and I'll pass it to Bronson now. Yeah, mahalo nui. So I think we have the opportunity to allow a few questions actually from the audience if anybody has a few burning things. You know, as our elders, at least in Hawaii, told us, you get one question a day, boy, so think hard before you ask. So don't say, what time is it? Okay, careful, use that question wisely. So, will anybody? Yes, Jonathan. Working. Well, I just want to thank the panel for this great discussion, and I feel that when tribes are finally able to take the lead with our lands, our, our, our planet's gonna be in a better place. And with our tribal leaders, they hear voices when it comes to our treaties. We are, our tribal leaders hear the voices of our ancestors, those that forged the path forward. You know, in the Northwest, we see these wildfires ravage some, some of our lands. You know, our tribes are working hard on restoring our, our rivers, my tribe in particular, with the salmon. So it's really important that our, our federal counterparts understand that when we come to the table, we hear the voices of our ancestors and we stand on their shoulders. But I really want to thank, thank the panel for the great discussion and for the Biden-Harris commitment to working with Native youth because really, when Native youth take that lead, our force is unstoppable. So I just want to say these few words and that, you know, if, you know, when it, moving this path forward, you know, we're looking for the next seven generations. And that's how our ancestors thought it. And that's the vision and the path that we're going to take forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Anybody wanted to run with that for a little bit? First of all, because you mentioned uh, salmon, which is an issue that um, uh, my office is spending a lot of time on as well, and I would say your reference to uh, ancestors and that being anchoring a uh, way in which the conversations have um, proceeded really resonates with me because I, it's been made clear in every conversation that we've had how, how central that is to the way people are thinking about what we should be doing and what we, you know, what we can do. Um, so I'm really just grateful for that partnership that we've had. I mean, we had... We had a really historic announcement just a few weeks ago about uh, salmon, re reintroducing salmon in the uh, kind of upper 
uh, Columbia River, which is a great thing and a great sort of a model. And we have a lot of work still going on on how we address the, the lower um, uh, river. But, but we can't do it without that partnership. And I think that was a clear message throughout. So I just really appreciate you saying that. Mahalani, Chair. Um, the one thing I'd say to that too is just to, to it's important for us to, as we're going back to really think about how this applies to things like when we're renegotiating the water issues that are happening, you know, with the Colorado River and everything. And 60% or even larger of our agricultural use is in California and these places. But I think it's time to start talking about how we're going to change the conditions because the conditions are change is a constant. Um, so how do we learn from what was to inform what can be, um, I think is going to be an important conversation on that, too, when we're looking at these challenges. Um, any other questions, too? Ooh, I seen sister with the hat. You want to go first? <laughs> uh, hello to everyone. Um, I have a specific question because I'm, I come from another country and the policies are, works different there. Uh, I wouldn't want to know uh, about the prior consultation, how it works here, because uh, in the country where I'm from, prior consultation, it's uh, very important in uh, where the, the government, the state, it's creating a new policy around uh, in the environment because the protection of nature, is, uh, it's related to the protection of the ancestral territory of many indigenous communities. So my, my question goes to how works the prior consultation in the work between the state itself and the, the indigenous tribes here. Uh, this is in order to understand how we in Colombia maybe could work better in order to, to protect our lands, but in a way that the, the public policy, it's also in an intersectional uh, environment, like an intersectional framework. That, that will be my question, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I guess um, I will answer by saying, I mean, consultation and recognizing the critical importance of consultation has been one of the main themes of the Biden administration. I think early on, we actually um, uh, issued uh, an executive order that sort of talked about recognizing um, that we have to consult in a better way and to be uh, more intentional both about how we do it and um, and ensure that it's actually meaningful. And so those are, those are themes that, that we talk a lot about. Um, I think one of the things that we've heard in our conversations is that we also have to be somewhat more strategic because it's a big burden on many tribes to have to consult on as many things as we're trying to get people to consult on. So figuring out how to be smart about how you're organizing um, the need for uh, tribal input and when you need it in ways that sort of recognize that, um, you know, that constraint and also to help support uh, communities that want to consult but can't, don't have the resources to consult, like to be able to participate in that way as well. Thank you. Oh, and looks like we still have time for another question as well. Um, or maybe we'll go with the two. One here. So indigenous people contribute the most to environmental success. As we've been stated, that we protect 80% of the world's biodiversity. And PBS says that we contribute to the least amount of greenhouse gas emissions. But indigenous people, are, if people suffer the most from climate injustice, 370 million indigenous people are neg negatively impacted. That's what nature.com says. So how does, how do you, I guess, you know, plan to specifically address these climate issues that really do impact Native people. You know, we have military bases that are polluting our waterways. We have man camps that are only just, you know, drilling oil and, you know, oil drills near our lands, but also these man camps specifically in target indigenous women. So how do you plan on rectifying these situations? So I think, look, I, you put your finger on the issue. Um, the global conversation around climate, I think, is incomplete um, if it doesn't recognize both the inequity in terms of how climate 
plays out today, um, but also the trajectory that got us here. Um, that's why one of the, I think, big focal points for our approach to climate, both domestically and internationally, is to make sure that we're focusing um, resources and attention and interventions um, in a way that uh, recognize the disproportionate impacts being felt, um, whether it's by indigenous communities um, or others who have been historically disadvantaged. Um, I'll give you an example of um, extreme heat, right? Um, it sounds like extreme heat impacts everybody. Maybe it would impact everybody evenly. But what the data show us is communities that were historically redlined here in the United States, the product of racist housing policy that made certain people live in certain places and others in other places just because of the way they looked. Those historically redlined communities are literally hotter a degree, two, or three more because of those practices. So as we go about building resilience, expanding tree cover, we're focusing our efforts there. Um, globally, uh, the president has dramatically expanded our contributions to efforts that boost resilience, especially in uh, places that are on the front lines of the changing climate. Investments through the Green Climate Fund, a billion dollars this past spring. Investments into the first ever Amazon Fund uh, to help compensate and help build capacity to restore that resource. But I think the crux of perhaps what you said is not just a place-based focus, but an accountability. Uh, to all of this. And that's so core to what we have to do. That's why the president, when he talks about global decarbonization, has recognized that major economies need to take the major emissions reductions. He's gathered them several times at the White House and otherwise to build strategies to decarbonize there. And the biggest industries, the ones that pollute the most, have the burden to decarbonize. That's why, for example, we are focusing heavily on reducing methane emissions from the oil and gas sector. And we're trying to tackle emissions from other facilities that people have looked at for a really long time and they've said, oh, well, we can't do anything about that, right? So for example, there are a lot of communities that live next to port areas. And we've looked at ports and we've said, oh, well, ports are really essential. <laughs> And so we just got to give them a free pass. Well, just this past Friday, the administration focused investments on over 28 ports, many of them operating in disadvantaged communities to help decarbonize those. So I think we've got to do all of that work. And then the final piece to the puzzle is not just investment and standards, but it's also enforcement. It's making sure that when people do break the law, uh, when they are doing something that is unlawful on the books, that you don't turn a blind eye to it, that we step up our resources and our capacity and capability there. And I think this administration on all of those fronts has really tried to prioritize that. And a big part of that, a big part of that is leadership. We've got to make sure that all across the government um, we've got an awareness and a sensitivity to this, and we've got leaders in every department who are taking the steps that need to be taken to make progress. And, and I think in this administration, we're making massive strides in that direction. But I'd be kidding you. I just want to do a little bit of truth. I'd be kidding you if I said, hey, everything's all good. Don't worry about it, because it's not. Um, we've made a ton of progress. That is a true statement. But we've got a long, long ways to go. Uh, and I think young people, whether it's pushing on the political aperture, whether it's holding people accountable at every level of government, whether it's continuing to inspire through all of the positive stuff that's going on, all of that is essential work because we've got a long ways to go. Thank you. Um, Can I just add some yes. words to that? Yes. Just, I agree with everything he said, double down. Um, 
Uh, I would just add to that the Justice 40 framework and the National Environmental Policy Act, two tools that I think are really important. Justice 40 being a program under the President's environmental justice uh, you know, agenda that basically commits to 40% of um, overall benefits going to disadvantaged communities, which includes federally recognized tribes. And so that, that is a tool that we are using to try to funnel resources. The National Environmental Policy Act, which is basically our framework for the federal government examining impacts on the activities that they are, are undertaking, um, also is a place in which we are trying to make sure that all of this kind of information, the sort of disproportionate impacts that you're talking about, the cumulative impacts that you're talking about, that we want that to be part of the analysis when we're doing significant activities. So just two things to also add to what Ali said. Holler, anybody else want to make any additions? If not, we got a second question. Last question, sorry. Time constraints. Halito Saho Chipo at Jacob Brittingham, Chata Seal Hoki. Hello, my name is Jacob Brittingham. I am Choctaw. Uh, I want to thank you for being here also. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your day to be with Indigenous youth. I was curious. Um, Living on the Choctaw Reservation, it, I am no stranger to having a lack of clean water and clean drinking water. And with Oklahoma being such a mineral-rich state and a land-rich state, uh, it's easy for environmental injustice to occur. So I wanted, since you mentioned environmental justice, I wanted to ask, what is the administration doing more to bring awareness to environmental injustice? And as an official, what would you advise us to do to bring awareness uh, in our communities? Okay. Yeah, so thank you so much. Again, this is another uh, issue which the president from the beginning or the middle of his campaign started focusing on the need for uh, his administration, if, it, if he were elected, to focus on the fact that we have disproportionate impacts occurring across this country to people who are low wealth, uh, uh, tribal nations, rural folks, uh, in ways that we want to try to make sure that we did not perpetuate. And so from the beginning, the administration has set up pillars within, within our own structure so that we are looking at these issues, that we have a way to bring the expert voices from the communities and from youth into the conversation so that we hear, uh, hear what the issues are that are important to you. We've created systems within our government to make sure the very senior levels of the federal government are talking about these issues and how we address them, not just that there's a problem, but like what are the solutions to the problem in ways that can be meaningful. So those are just institutional things that we've tried to do. I mentioned Justice 40, but I think on every issue and across every agency, like the, the focus has really been on understanding that we can't continue to do things the way we've always done them. And so finding ways in which we are engaging people at the community level around the specific things that they are, um, that they are most concerned about is really an important aspect, I think, of the way that we're trying to approach these issues. It's, it's a lot and it's hard, but I think that that is really our focus. And on water in particular, this president has actually focused on water quality in ways that you know, have not done, been done before. A lot of the money from the bipartisan infrastructure law has actually gone into like not just water quality, but like sanitation systems and, and on other things that are related to that. Lead in water, PFAS in water, all of these things make water an important issue for him. And I think that we are, as, you know, as we've just suffered a very significant loss from the Supreme Court on a water case, I think we're all focused on how do we actually make sure that we don't have things on the ground be um, made so much worse because of, of this new decision. Um, just one, one additional thought. You asked how you can help. Um, you know, we, we live on a moment in climate where all of you have seen the sky turn orange. You've breathed in the smoke from wildfires burning miles away. Um, for many of you, you sit in a community where a coastline or a flood threatens your very existence. You've seen the biology, just in your lifetimes, change in a way that runs counter to your ability to sustain uh, yourselves, but also an entire way of life and a memory generations in the building. Um, and I think there's a lot of reason from all of that to feel a sense of despair and hopelessness and cynicism about places like Washington. 
And I think the thing I'd say to you, the thing that you can do that's so profoundly powerful, and for those watching online, you can feel the optimism and the idealism and the sense of possibility in this room, is to keep after the good stuff. Because young people marched, you talked about that, because young people have stepped up and voiced their concerns, we passed a law that makes the biggest investment in water infrastructure in the history of this country, the biggest investment in climate in the history of this country, the biggest investment in environmental justice, the hard work of repairing in the history of this country. The work's not done, but it's being propelled because young people and people all across this country are willing to be hopeful and believe in the possibilities, believe in what could be. That's the key. Don't succumb to the cynicism, to the skepticism, because here's the fact. The polluters we're talking about holding accountable, they want you to feel cynical. They want you to feel like you don't have power, but you do, so keep at it. Mahalani for um, answering that question. I know um, time's a little tight, but I did want to take a jab too, and I'm sure maybe some of the others too want to um, briefly chime in. I think it's really important, right, that we honor the understanding that it's time to build the roots on the ground and get, I'm tired of getting boots on the ground. I ain't need it. We don't need other people's help when we know the solutions that are needed in our own respective places and really appreciate the um, supports that have been given that we can build those roots on the ground. And the other thing I would challenge each and every one of us to is one of the things that the elders said is, you know, some people, when they're navigating, they tend to look at the finger, but nobody really learned how to read the stars. So forever question the person who points the fingers, too. Don't feel afraid, because you know they're going to be our yesterday, but we're going to be the tomorrow. So you got to start making the decisions now. Um, and that's something that's always been fun, because I always get fun when we talk about carbon and other things, because it's like, now we're finding out Jupiter has seasons, too. But wait, it's not on the axis. Now we're finding out the sun's impacting the atmospheric clouds in Neptune. Meanwhile, our Kupuna were like, we told you this was coming, boy. So get ready and plant that tree now. Wow. <laughs> so anyway, mahalo. mahalo. Okay, if not, looks like we're going to be um, transitioning, but sadly, no break, everybody, because time's a little tight. So I believe next up is going to be the fireside chat. Somebody coming up doing that introduction of it. Thank you, everybody, for talking and asking all those good, wonderful questions. Okay, next, introducing Raina Thiel with the Fireside Chat, Opportunities for Youth and Careers in Public Service. Give it up for Raina Thiel. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Excellent, excellent. Well, it's so great to have all of you here. Um, we have an amazing panel for you today. So one of the things that we really like to do during these conferences we're all federal officials. We have this, uh, you know, kind of years of experience doing federal work. And we would hope that folks in this room would also have some interest in possibly serving in the federal government or really government at any level, whether it's state government, federal government, uh, even your uh, local government, tribal government. There are so many ways to serve. And so we have an amazing panel for you today of some of the heads of hiring for the federal government, Gautam Raghavan and Robert uh, Schreiber. And they work in kind of two different spaces. The first is political appointments, which is a presidentially appointed uh, role, which is temporary by nature. And they'll kind of get into some of the nuance here, uh, but also career positions, which are uh, much more permanent. Uh, which have a little, well, they're both kind of like the, the uh, road to these positions can be a little bit long, but the career positions are much more permanent than the presidential appointed positions. So before I turn over to our wonderful panelists, and just to let folks know, after this 15-minute conversation up here, we actually have federal officials at every table, including Brian Newland and a bunch of other folks who are going to have a conversation with all of you after this panel about their path to federal service, uh, what inspired them to do that, uh, and why they think that uh, it's an opportunity that is worth doing. Because you can really make a difference. Uh, you really learn how the federal government works and how policy works. 
And so it's really a great way for folks to, uh, to become more engaged in the policymaking process and the decisions that are uh, so important to all of us. So before I hand it over, I'm just going to kind of quickly introduce myself. My name is Raina Thiel. I serve as Senior Advisor to Secretary Deb Holland for Alaska Affairs and Strategic Priorities. I've been in this position for about two, I think two and a half years at this point, uh, thanks to Galaxum and other folks who run our federal hiring process. Uh, but before this position, I was actually in the Obama White House uh, as the President's Tribal Liaison. And so I had an opportunity to bring President Obama to various places in the country. That includes Standing Rock Reservation, to communities in Alaska, to Choctaw Nation uh, back in 2015, 2016. And so that position was an incredible opportunity, uh, one that you know, I was able to help our Native communities connect with the President, uh, but also to learn how our federal government works and kind of the, people call it kind of sausage making because it's, it's extremely complex. Uh, to create a policy that has staying power in the federal government, uh, but it's really worthwhile. You know, it's like it, it requires patience is what federal government teaches you, but in my opinion, that patience has been life lesson that's been really important as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our wonderful panelists here. Gautam, I'm going to start with you. And just so folks know, Gautam and I are actually former colleagues at the White House in the Obama administration, so it's great to have him up here with me today. Here we go. So here, first we'll hear from Gautam, who is assistant to the president and director of the White House uh, Presidential Personnel Office. He was the first employee hired by the Biden transition team where he served as Deputy Head of Presidential Appointments. Previously, Gautam served as Chief of Staff to Representative, I might butcher this, Pramila Jayapal. Uh, she was the Chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus and Vice President of Policy at the Gill Foundation. Gautam also served in the Obama administration as the Public Engagement Liaison for the LGBTQ community, as well as Asian American and Pacific Islander community. He is a first-generation immigrant, and he was born in India, raised in Seattle, and went to Stanford University. He is the editor of the book West Wingers, Stories from the Dream Chasers, Change Makers, and Hope Creators Inside the Obama White House, which I was <laughs> very lucky and honored to be able to contribute a chapter to that book. Um, but it's a, it's a great way to kind of hear some of these stories firsthand. He currently lives with his husband and their daughter in Washington, D.C. So with that, Gautam, I would just like to ask you, can you talk a little bit about your story, how you ended up in federal government, and what the opportunities are for Native youth? Sure. Thanks, Raina. And thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, your participation is, is exciting and inspiring, so I hope you get a lot out of the day. You know, I got my start in D.C. Um, now 19 years ago. I moved here uh, in 2004 because I wanted to change the world. Um, still working on it, uh, but uh, I've, I've been glad to be here in that period of time. And the thing that really drew me to D.C. at that moment in time was uh, the fight for LGBTQ equality. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a national debate back then around marriage equality, and I was recently out of the closet, and to me, it felt like an important moment to get involved personally and to fight for my community and my equality. Uh, fast forward to the start of the Obama administration, I had the chance to work with the Department of Defense and then in the White House, as Raina said, as the liaison to the LGBTQ community and the Asian, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community. And what I got from that whole period of time is that government isn't just some abstract thing out there. Uh, the decisions that are made here in this agency at the White House across the federal government directly impact our communities, especially if we're from communities that haven't been represented and that, quite frankly, folks haven't cared about that much in the past. And so uh, everything I learned from that six years was that it's important for our uh, communities to be represented, for us to be involved and engaged, even if our job isn't to specifically work on our community's issues, just that visibility and the um, representation we bring and the fact that we're bringing lived experiences and stories that are different from everyone else's, um, that makes a real difference. So when I had the chance to serve in this administration, the thing I wanted to work on the most was helping the president build his team. 
as Raina said, you know, we have about 4,000 political appointments across the administration, everything from cabinet secretaries and ambassadors down to staff assistants and press secretaries and researchers. So there's lots of opportunity. We're always hiring. Um, and I hope we get to talk a little bit about that, but I would encourage anyone here who's interested and is really fired up by what we're trying to accomplish in this administration to think about applying uh, and get involved in, in some way or another because, uh, like I said, the work is is uh, deeply important. It reaches all of our communities, and if we're not a part of it, um, then we're going to be left out. Great, thank you, Gautam. And and just to put a plug in here, but under Gautam's leadership for presidential personnel, we have more Native appointees in this administration than ever before in history. <laughs> Including our secretary. Of including our first uh, cabinet secretary. So shout out to Secretary Holland, wherever she is. Yes. <laughs> okay, next we have Rob Schreiber. Uh, he is the deputy director of the Office of Personnel Management. His portfolio includes recruiting and hiring, pay and leave, and supporting diversity, equity, and inclusion. Rob previously served as deputy general counsel at OPM uh, during the Obama administration. Rob earned his BA from Virginia Tech and his JD from GW University Law School. He lives in Alexandria, Virginia with his wife, Joanne, and their three children. So Rob, tell me a little bit about your path to Washington, D.C. and uh, how youth can get more involved in OPM and career opportunities. Uh, thanks, Raina, and, and thanks to Gautam. I wouldn't be here without him either. Um, and so uh, wonderful to see all of you, the opportunity to speak to um, young folks who have an interest in government. These are always my favorite speaking engagements, so great to see you. Um, so I grew up in <clears throat> Nazareth, Pennsylvania, which was a cement mill town right next door to Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Bethlehem Steel. Uh, so from a very early age, um, you know, I was always affected and impacted by um, unions and uh, from also a very early age, really cared about making sure that workers were treated fairly, that workers had justice, that there was equitable economic opportunities. It was just the way that I um, was brought up. So I, I came to Washington, D.C. I went to law school. I worked for uh, a labor union. The labor union happened to represent federal employees. I thought I would spend my whole career at that labor union. I loved that job. Uh, but then uh, President Obama gave his Yes, We Can speech. I signed up for the campaign. Uh, and when he won, I just knew I needed to find a way to try to, you know, advance the things that I cared about however I could. And, and that got me into OPM. <clears throat> and uh, once you're in, you have no idea what kind of opportunities are going to come up. So I had this union background working on workforce issues. The Affordable Care Act was passed. They needed somebody to lead OPM's efforts to implement that. I got that opportunity. So all of a sudden, then I was in healthcare, and I did healthcare really from that point until I just came back um, as a day one appointee in the in the Biden administration. Was able to come back to OPM and lead our workforce policy shop, and now find myself in my dream job of being the OPM uh, deputy director. So I think one of the messages that I want to give you is that. There is literally a version of every dream job that you could think of in the federal government, every kind of job. And all, I've met all kinds of cool people from uh, you know scientists who are researching cancer cures to lawyers who argue in the Supreme Court to one of my favorite people I ever met was a smoke jumper who actually parachutes into forest fires um, and fights the fires. I mean, she was an amazing woman and it was so cool. So there's really every kind of opportunity, but as my experience shows, like your path can go in different directions. So I would say that D don't insist on that first job being the dream job. Get in the door, and you get in the door, and you do a good job, and you're curious, and you work hard. It's a lot easier to move around and find your way to that dream job once you're, once you're in the federal government. So that's something to think about. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I've had the opportunity uh, to work as with a career official as well as a presidential appointee. I think that dis that distinction is sometimes a little bit difficult for folks to understand in the federal government. 
Uh, so maybe I'll ask Scout to just kind of explain what that means to folks who may not be familiar with those terms. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I'm uh, married to a career civil servant. Uh, my husband's been at the State Department for 12 years, so he's worked in and out of different administrations, so I have some firsthand experience with this. Look, I mean, I think the most important distinction is that all of us who are appointees come and go with the administration. So we all have expiration dates when the president is out of office, which I hope is in five years. Uh, we're all out of office, too. Um, and so that means that the, the period of time which we're allowed to serve really counts, right? And we, it, there's a sense of urgency and purpose and drive to execute the president's mission every single day. Um, what that also means is that we're constantly working with career civil servants to make sure what we're doing, as I think you said, has staying power. That uh, the programs we're building, the you know whether it's the infrastructure bill or the Chips and Science Act or everything we're trying to do around um, healthcare, that that stays far beyond uh, the, the period of time that we get to serve. So usually, what you'll find is you know political appointees tend to be um, senior officials and the people who directly support them. Um, our work, our functions tend to be generally more political in a sense, right? We're uh, you'll find more of us doing legislative affairs or outreach or communications or press work um, than you might find elsewhere. Usually for jobs that require some deep technical expertise, those tend to be career civil servants who really need to build up that uh, knowledge over a period of time. Um, but I would say also, if, if you're uh, interested in service, you should consider all the options available to you. And many political appointees love it so much that they decide, hey, I actually want to continue my service beyond the end of this administration and then apply for career jobs too. So, but I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Rob. Yeah, I mean, uh, so what did Gallon say? There's 4,000 political appointees. That's out of 2.2 um, million federal employees. So the vast majority of federal employees are career employees. They are um, assessed as applicants and hired and evaluated based on their skills, their subject matter expertise, what they bring to the job. Um, the law prohibits them from being um, evaluated, rewarded, or penalized based on their political affiliation. And honestly, it is one of the hallmarks of our democracy that we have a career civil service that brings that uh, expertise to the table, no matter who's in charge. Uh, and it is such a, a critical role. And one of the things we do at OPM is make sure that um, the guardrails are in place uh, to protect that career civil service so that everybody, the American public, knows that if you're applying for a federal job other than one of those 4,000 that are in um, the political range, um, that it's about your skills, it's about what you bring to the table, it's about your subject matter expertise. Um, and so that's really an important fundamental of, of our whole system, really. And can I just make one more plug, which is if you're interested or if you know someone who's interested, it's super easy to apply. Go to whitehouse.gov, scroll all the way to the bottom, and there's a place where it says join us. You just fill out your application there. It goes directly into our database, and we hear about it, and we're always looking. So uh, don't, don't be shy. Um, if you're interested at all, even if you're just beginning to think about it, fill out an application. And one really amazing opportunity is the White House Internship Program, which is now paid. Mm -hmm. uh, which is it? The is the next session the, the summer session? Applications or? are currently open for. Oh my gosh! I think we're into summer already of next year. So wonderful. So before we we finish up here, I just want to ask one more question, and I'll kind of start with myself. But uh, what is the most inspiring moment you've had in your federal service for me? Uh, I have two, I would say I have two. The first is working for Secretary Deb Holland uh, because she's an absolutely amazing, inspiring figure. Uh, and the second would probably be in the Obama administration. I actually helped to start the first ever White House Tribal Youth Gathering. So those are my two inspiring moments. But I would love to hear your inspiring moments as well. Um, well, I think in general, whenever we have the opportunity to, to appoint someone or nominate someone who is the first of something, it's exciting, right? Because not just because they're making history and the president's making history, but the signal it sends, especially to communities that have never seen someone from their community in that kind of a position, I think it's, it's a big deal, so including the secretary, obviously. And I think the other, you know, for, for me, um, was probably back in 2015 when the marriage equality uh, Supreme Court decision came down and the White House was lit up in rainbow lights. Some of you have probably seen pictures of it was a really meaningful day, not just because of uh, the legal change that it meant for families like mine, but also because of all the work that went into that moment happening, not just from folks in government, but from activists and advocates who had been working for decades to realize uh, the hope of marriage equality. I mean, that's a great example of how all this work takes a lot of time, and it takes all of us, mm -hmm. but it pays off. 
I'll connect up to that as um, an enthusiastic ally of the LGBTQ uh, movement. I, at the time that Gallum's describing, <clears throat> excuse me, I was working for um, OPM director John Barry, who at the time was the highest um, openly gay ranking official in US government history. And don't ask, don't tell, and Defense of Marriage Act were in place. And he said to me, Rob, your charge is to find everything you can do within our existing power to advance equality for LGBTQ federal families. It was just a wonderful charge to be given as a young lawyer and an ability to work not only across OPM but across the whole administration on that. It was amazing. Um, and then um, in, in this administration, uh, I'll go back to the wildland firefighters and the smoke jumper who I mentioned up front. Um, so that work had been largely seasonal for a long time, but climate change has really changed the nature of those jobs and the occupation had not caught up. So we had wildland firefighters that were risking their lives day in and day out um, and were living in their cars. Like they just weren't, the, 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 the compensation wasn't measuring up. Thanks to President Biden's leadership, there was a big new provision in the bipartisan infrastructure law that OPM had to lead in implementing. Um, and we worked really hard to put $600 million <clears throat> in those wildland firefighters' pockets. And I got to meet with them before it was implemented and hear their stories. And then I got to meet with them again after it was implemented. And just, you know, it was such a privilege to be able to talk as a leader in the Biden Harris administration about that work and how it was going to impact their day to day lives. Well, thank you both so much. It's been a wonderful overview of what federal opportunities exist for young people, Native youth included. Um, let's give them a huge round of applause. So I think our next step here, we have about 20, 25 minutes, I believe, to speak with. There should be a federal official at each of these tables. If you are a federal official and you're not at your table, please make your way <laughs> right now. But we're going to have every federal official at your table give about a five minute overview of themselves, introduce themselves, tell you about what inspired them to uh, engage in the position they currently occupy. And then you have about 15, 20 minutes to ask questions of the federal official at your table and just have a dialogue. So please enjoy, learn as much as you can, and uh, we'll come back together after that. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm here to kind of act as the villain here. We're gonna uh, close out the conversations. Thank you so much to our federal officials. I don't know if all of us fully realize the immense authority and power that these folks in the room have, and the fact that the administration itself is being led at the highest levels by some of our indigenous communities best and brightest is just, it's truly amazing and inspiring. I hope that the conversations went well, and I'd like to pass it over to Katie. Thank you again. It is my honor to introduce Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Becerra. Xavier Becerra is the 25th Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services and the first Latino to hold the office in the history of the United States. As Secretary, he focuses on ensuring that all Americans have health security and access to health care. Previously, Secretary Becerra served as Attorney General for the State of California, and before that, he served 12 terms in Congress as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Secretary Becerra is the son of a working class parent. He was the first in his family to receive a four-year degree, earning his Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Stanford University. He earned his Juris Doctorate from Stanford Law School. Throughout his career, the Secretary has made it his, pr his priority to ensure that Americans have access to affordable health care they need to survive and thrive. From his early days as a legal advocate representing individuals with mental illnesses to his role as the Attorney, Attorney General of the State of California and now Secretary of the Department and Health, Ser Health and Human Services. Secretary Becerra, everyone.
So, Caitlin, thank you very much. Um, appreciate the words. And I begin to realize how old I am when I start to see, hear about all those things. But uh, it's nice to be with you. Can I do a quick uh, poll? Can I ask uh, how many of you are from west of the Mississippi? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that doesn't tell me that much. How many are you from the east of the Mississippi? Okay, how many from any California? How many California? Oh, excellent. excellent. <laughs> okay. And my understanding is that Unity and others made it possible for you to come. I hope you take full advantage of the day. You've had many of the leaders of the Biden administration come by. I understand Tom Perez, who is the president's senior advisor, and he's the director of the White House's Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, already spoke to you. I understand that you're going to have some of our folks, uh, the head of our uh, agency that deals with mental health services and substance use disorder will also be here with you. And it is, uh, I don't know if Rose, uh, Rosalind is going to be coming. Uh, so uh, we're going to have also coming Rosalind So, who is the head of our Indian Health Services. Indian Health Services, which is based here at uh, Health and Human, the Department of Health and Human Services, is the biggest agency at providing health care in Indian country. Uh, Annually, we provide health care directly to about 2.5 million uh, American Indians and Alaska Natives. Uh, and it is the largest agency that offers those health care services throughout Indian country. I wanted to mention a, a, a few things to you. I hope to help you understand why we're so pleased that so many of you made it here. On top of this being uh, Native American Heritage Month, on top of understanding now how important it is for us to take care of our lands and begin to do things that heal our nation in so many ways, both naturally and spiritually, I think we're beginning to recognize that we've missed an opportunity with peoples who have always sought that throughout their heritage. And so the fact that we're you're here, we're here, is I hope a testament that this administration, the Biden administration, is very interested in engaging you. Let me put it to you this way. You didn't pay for that seat you're sitting in, but if I were to tell you how much it costs to actually have you come in and have an opportunity to be here, whether it was to eat a meal, to hear from some of the leaders of this country, or just a fly round trip or travel round trip, someone is investing in you for a reason. Someone sees in you a leader that we must harness now. And certainly someone who is a leader in Indian country where we need more and more voices to come forward. And so I hope, uh, aside from getting to know different people for, that you've never met before, or perhaps being able to connect with someone at the national level that you were hoping to work with in the future, I hope what you'll remember is that someone has identified you as being a future leader of this country. And I hope they'll take full advantage of that. And let me give you a quick example of how important it is to have leaders step forward. I mentioned Indian Health Services. Uh, it is the largest, as I said, department that offers direct health care services in Indian country. It is the largest department in the federal government outside of the Department of Interior which hires people of Native American ancestry to work at the federal level. But here's what's interesting. Indian Health Services has been at the whim of Congress when it comes to funding. Every year under the Constitution, Congress must pass an appropriation bill, funding bill, so that the government can keep operating. You probably heard the stories about how the government almost shut down at the end of September, how if we don't get another funding bill passed by November 17th, coming up real soon, the government has to shut down because we don't have the power to, to even put on the lights in this room and have you come in here unless the Congress passes a budget that gives us the money and the authority to do that. Well, interestingly enough, there are some programs that fall under what's called mandatory funding. Mandatory funding is different from the discretionary funding, which depends on Congress every year passing a budget. Mandatory funding, Social Security, Medicare. If you're a senior, 
You paid into the Medicare system. Every year you're going to get it, whether or not the government shut down or not. Medicaid for low-income folks. That's always available. Department of Defense, most of what the Department of Defense does because of national security. They get their money. Indian Health Service is part of the discretionary budget. Every time you hear about a potential government shutdown, Indian Health Services, Director So and her team have to start unwinding and start telling people, here's your discharge slip. We'll let you know when you can come back into work. That means all throughout the country where those direct health services are being provided in health clinics, hospitals, they too have to shut down. Only in Indian country. And that's because Indian Health Services is funded through discretionary funding. So if the government shuts down on November 17th, all those health services, the people you probably know, who you probably care about, they will not be available. We are dependent on that funding. And so the games that are being played on the Hill, passing a budget, not passing a budget, those have real consequences. But here's where leadership comes in. It wasn't until this year that that story I just told you was fact. But we have been fighting with many, probably many of the leaders from the various tribes throughout this country to change that dynamic that makes Indian health, Indian health and Indian country captive, victims to the politics of budgeting on Capitol Hill. This year, if the government shuts down, Indian Health Services will get its money. Because we were able to, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal. It's a big deal because what we did was we had Congress pass a provision that says that Indian Health Services will get advanced appropriations. So it still has to go through the discretionary budget. But now Indian country gets them a year in advance. And so Indian country will get, for the Indian Health Services, its money to keep the doors open to those health clinics and health care hospitals now, even if the government shuts down. Now, we would rather have Indian Health Services treated the way Social Security and Medicare are treated, which is mandatory spending. By law, it must continue even if the government shuts down. But we couldn't quite get there. But we were able to fight to get advanced appropriations, which means a year, and a, a year ahead of time, Congress is giving us the money. So last year, Congress gave us the money for this fiscal year. But if they don't do something over the next year, we won't have advanced funding for next the following year. And so we, rather than be at the whims of Congress and be held hostage to what politics is going on on the Hill, we would rather have Indian Health Services treated like mandatory funding which we believe continues to fulfill our responsibilities as a federal government to Indian nations across this country. We're not there yet. We should be. You can make it happen. I think that's why you're here, because you have an opportunity to change the dynamic that lets some families in America Go with that health care because somebody in, in Washington, D.C., in Congress is playing politics with the budget. And no one's health should be held hostage to political games on a budget. Hopefully we get there. But if not, be ready. When we tell you you're in that plane and you got that parachute on you, I hope you pack your parachute really, really well. Because when we tell you it's time for you to jump, you got to know that parachute works. And so that's why I think you're here. That's why no one asks you to pay for your visit. Because someone sees something in you, an opportunity to make a difference. So hurry up. Finish school. Make a difference. But know that we need you because there are things like making Indian Health Services mandatory in terms of America's funding and not at the whims of politics on the Hill in Congress. I hope you get not just enjoyment out of today. I hope we feed you well. I hope you are able to get back home safely. But I hope you recognize someone decided to give you a chance to have a ticket to be in that seat without having to pay a single cent 
so you can come back and make a big difference. Thank you for what you do. And if I can say, I know, I understand that there are several international indigenous individuals who are here from various countries. I understand Mexico, Honduras, Brazil. Uh, are they here right now, by the way? I don't see any. I don't know if they're here, but it, it, Colombia, Mexico, Guatemala, Brazil, uh, Honduras, Canada, uh, here, international. I want to thank them for being able to be with us today because we have to, to break bread and make uh, embrace all of our communities. And so I hope they are able to take something back as well. We have hosted this conference two years in a row here at HHS. You keep coming here because we think it's very important. But more importantly, we want your help to make Indian Health Services a mandatory part of the federal government's commitment to Americans throughout this land. Thank you very much for having me. Good. If I could have everybody stand up but stay in your seats. We're going to get a photo with him, with you guys in the background, so stand up. <coughs> Appreciate you. Thank you, Javier. Mr. MC. Make sure you everybody smiles. Thank you, everybody. I just want to say thank you again to Secretary Becerra. We are now about to head to lunch, but before we head to lunch, I would like to welcome Watson Whitford to the stage to provide us with a prayer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm sorry, but I forgot my script for the prayer. Just kidding. <laughs> but if you could all remove your hats. Um, I appreciate you all for being here. I'm so glad to be here and to be amongst all of you. It does feel powerful in this room to see all of you, to hear all of you speak, to see your beautiful clothing and where you come from. And so it's really awesome to be here. And I encourage you to continue the work that you do for your communities, for your people. Do this for the future generations that come after us because our ancestors had done this for us too, for us to be here. So continue to do what you do. You make everybody proud. You make your people proud. I'm proud to be here. And so I'll offer a prayer really quick. Kisagalpi sim tip scalpi sim wapanatak. Pia suak vikask mustuskusia. Hashtail te hashtail one. Nilmas san. Yadehe. Kinas kumto tin. Acheha. For everything that we have, Daina Kisimatu. Very thankful for everything that we have. Very thankful for the opportunities to come here to show our presence, to show our leadership, to show our care that we have for our people. I'm very thankful for the strength that we have to make change, to wake up every morning, and to do these things for our community, to get an education, to learn our culture, to speak the language, to practice our ceremonies, to dance, to sing. I ask that our people, the youth here, they could continue to do that. They could wake up every day knowing that they're going to make change. We could make our ancestors proud. We could make our grandparents, our parents proud, our aunties, uncles. They could continue to encourage us. We could encourage each other in our communities to make change, to speak our languages, to 
to be kind and caring for one another in Taino Hisimatu. I ask that for all of us here. And I ask that these tribes that we have all over the world, our indigenous peoples, they could be taken care of in a good way. They could continue to speak their languages. The babies can be fluent in the language in Taino Hisimatu. They could grow up and then they could teach their children. Way in the future in Taino Hisimatu, our people can be fluent again in our languages. They could be powerful in that way that we could continue to have our voices in a beautiful way. We could continue to walk beautifully in Kesimantu. We could be able to live that way, to live in beauty, to speak beautifully to one another. Very thankful again for this opportunity to be here with all of them. And I ask that as they came here safely, everybody that attended this could attend or to travel back home safely too. They could take this powerful feeling that they have, this good feeling that they have here in Tainan Kisimantu, they could take it back home to bring it back to their people. They can share it with their people. They can make change in their communities with what they get from this Tainan Kisimantu. Igual, all the federal workers that work here, all the people that are making change in our communities in this country, all over the world, they could be protected in Tainan Kisimantu. As they go out into this world, they could be protected because of all the work that they do. Egwa, they could be taken good, they could have good, long, happy, healthy lives, along with everybody else here. Very thankful for everything, the food that we eat today, it'll be, we could eat it and we could feel well, and we could continue the work that we're doing. This food can be able to be healing, could be feeling. Thank you for everything, and I ask that we could continue to live our beautiful ways of life. Hi, hi. Thank you, guys. Produced by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Box for all of you. Just kidding. <laughs>